Hello, we're here at Share on Landscape. Uh, and we have Doug Chinnery to talk to, with us about creative uh, landscape photography with intentional camera movement and multiple exposures, um, which you've seen an introduction of in the recent article. It's very interesting, including Chris Friel and Valda Bailey. We're going to be presenting this in three separate parts. So the first part will be about uh, the, the whys, wherefores, um, going through some pictures to show what's done. In the second part, we're going to go out with uh, Doug and do some photography uh, and video it so we can show you what, what, what it's like in the field. And in the third part, in another webinar, we're going to do some demonstrations of how to post-process the pictures and get the final results. So welcome, Doug. Hi. Thanks for having me, Tim. No problem at all. Um, yeah, so if you can give us a bit of background on why, how you got into doing the uh, intentional camera movement, creative photography, etc. And, and possibly, possibly what, what, you, what, you, what you mean by creative photography, because I know all photography is creative. And you're not saying it's a subset yeah. genre. Okay. Uh, I'll start off with um, how I got into doing it, first of all, perhaps. Um, I probably started, I think, um, as many photographers who were into this sort of creative style of photography, um, when I first saw Chris Friel's work, I think yes. a lot of us that are into this kind of uh, image making uh, I've been inspired by Chris and what he did or what he does um, when I saw Chris's work initially he wasn't actually doing ICM at that stage uh, he was uh, if you go back through his flicker string and go back probably four or five years maybe um, back to the sort of early days when he was posting on Flickr you'll find that uh, he's not using ICM techniques, intentional camera movement techniques, but he was using tilt and shift lenses. Um, and so his images are perhaps a bit more conventional to what we're used to that he's producing now. Um, but there were creative effects. He was using blur, uh, using the shift mechanisms on the camera lens, yes. um, just to give a creative effect. Uh, and that really inspired me. I had never seen anything like it. And whereas everything that I'd been shown before was very conventional landscape photography, uh, that really opened my eyes to the possibilities uh, as to, to what could be achieved if you just started breaking some rules with the camera, uh, started yeah. looking at the world a little bit differently. Uh, and so that got me into thinking differently about photography. So really I can sort of put uh, all, uh, all my gratitude for this really down to Chris Friel uh, as the starting right. point. Um, so what, what, what we'll do is we'll hand over to you now, but if anybody's got any questions, if you can um, type them in using the panel on your right hand side, um, and we'll try and collate them together and either ask them to Doug during the process of the webinar, or we'll have 15 minutes at the end and we'll try and group the questions together so we're not interrupting him too much. So um, yeah, thank you very much Doug, take it away. Okay, that's great. Well, I'm just going to switch off my webcam so I disappear and hopefully now you can see uh, my main sort of uh, Lightroom screen here uh, and perhaps if uh, I bring that up. So here we've got just a, a sort of a conventional landscape image, um, perfectly normal, nothing unusual about it, um, just taken up on the Northumberland coast and certainly if, if I'm out taking images um, and I, I, I see a beautiful scene I've got absolutely no objection at all um, to taking quite conventional landscape photographs. Um, so uh, I'll, I'll sort of go for front to back sharpness and I'll use all the conventional techniques um, and expose correctly, you know, expose to the right and all the usual things uh, that we're taught as uh, landscape photographers. Um, and certainly my commercial customers, this is the kind of imagery generally that they want for greetings cards and calendars and stock. Uh, this is the kind of imagery that most of the magazines um, want to display. So I've got absolutely no sort of objection to this kind of imagery. You know, I love it. Uh, I've got some of it on my own walls at home and so on. Um, and so uh, I take this myself. But I also find that when I look at this kind of imagery, um, which is uh, sharp and conventional, that it's not quite as fulfilling to me personally. So when I look at images like these, because they're so sharp from front to back, because 
everything is so clear because digital technology or even uh, film cameras with, with sharp lenses and so on are so good at rendering a scene accurately. Within a few seconds of looking at the photograph, I find that the photographs told me everything that there is to know about the image. I've seen all the detail. I know exactly what's going on. And while the photograph might be beautiful and I can appreciate the skill in the way it's been taken, I lose interest in it very quickly uh, because I see a lot of very similar photographs and um, th there's nothing more to discover in the image. So when I started to see photographers like Chris Friel uh, and then I began to investigate other photographers work and started to look at this, uh, this sort of genre of photographers who were a bit more creative in the way they portrayed the world around them. Um, so I would look at and encourage you to look at photographers um, like uh, Chris Tancock, uh, who works down in, in Pembrokeshire and does amazing things with a camera, describes himself as a rural documentary photographer. Um, photographers like Paul Kenny, uh, Val de Bailey, who we mentioned uh, in the article. Uh, there's a Japanese photographer called Takeshi Shikama. Um, and then photographers who are not perhaps landscape photographers, but use similar techniques to the ones we're going to be talking about this evening. Uh, people like Alexei Titarenko, Susan Bernstein, Sarah Moon. Um, and there are links to all these photographers on the inspirations page on my website. So you can go and have a look at their images. Um, when you look at their work, what I find is that there's more to be discovered in the image. Not everything hits you in the face straight away. Uh, things are more obscure. Um, you're allowed to build a story around the image or make your own mind up as to what's going on because things are not quite as they seem very often. Uh, often you can look at the picture for some time and then discover something because everything's not tack sharp. There are things hidden away uh, and those pictures I find hold my interest a lot more and also, you don't see as many of those kind of images about. Um, they're very hard to copy. You, can, you, you can't uh, duplicate those images. They're often, or they, they're almost always made in locations. You, you've no idea where they are. The location really is not very important. No, no and so they're not I find about that, the location, are they? No, they're not about the location at all. And so, uh, and, and as well, um, they're not either as much about the technique or the kit that's been used, funnily enough, although you have to have an understanding of how to use the camera. Um, and maybe for some techniques, I use a tilt and shift lens or, or, or things like that. I, I don't obsess about the kit and I don't obsess about the technique. And so I tend to carry several different cameras with me in my bag and I will just get whatever camera out of the bag that I feel will give me the results that I'm looking for from the scene that I have in front of me. And, and I don't mind whether that's a high-end digital camera like a Canon 5D Mark III or a Nikon D800, um, or whether it's my wooden pinhole camera, which has just got a roll of black and white film in it and it's got no lens and no viewfinder. The piece of kit is almost irrelevant. Um, so, for example, um, Here's a, an image taken with a pinhole camera, which is still quite a conventional landscape image, but just by using a pinhole camera, things have started to get a bit softer. The length of exposure has started to render the world in a slightly different way. And straight away to me, there is more emotion in the picture than there would have been if I'd have taken exactly the same shot with my Canon 5D Mark II and um, a very sharp prime lens. Um, another image here uh, of Elgol from the Isle of Skye, an exposure of two or three minutes long um, of a very classic location, but I just like the softness um, that's created by the pinhole camera. So there's nothing fancy going on here. This is just the camera on a tripod being pointed at the scenes. There's no camera movement or anything, but already I'm using a different tool to give me a different look and this is just the sort of first steps into um, sort of creative photography starting to move away 
from this craving that so many landscape photographers have, this sort of pursuit for front to back sharpness and intense detail. I wanted to cram as much into their pictures as they possibly can with wide angle lenses, uh, going for intense drama um, all the time. And it's a sort of a, a pulling away from that. You don't mind me interrupting for a second, Doug. We've just, yeah, sure. um, we've, we've just, we've just found out that the software we've got is, is limiting people, even though we could subscribe 160 people to the webinar, it's actually limiting people entering to 100. So if, if anybody in there is, um, is, is uh, started doing anything else or not listening to it. I'm not sure if it, it's possible to drop out. We're not asking anybody to wander away, but if uh, if anybody isn't li isn't particularly listening to it and not not interested, just got it on in the background. Or um, and it, if there's space for somebody else to come in, um, then let us know. Um, and for people who are watching this on video later, really sorry about this. It's something we're going to take up the software people because we. It seems strange okay. to allow us to subscribe 160 and then only let 101 in. Um, yeah. Sorry about interrupting you, Doug. Uh, you carry on. Yeah, no problem at all. Um, another aspect of um, the sort of the creative process before we get into things like ICM and, and that kind of thing um, as well is um, a sort of a, a more creative approach to composition. Um, so I'm sort of always encouraging people to try and look at the world a bit differently to the way um, we're constantly shown that we ought to be sort of framing things up. Um, so we can still portray the world in quite a sharp way, not necessarily using techniques like blur and so on, but still be a bit more creative in our approach to perhaps make our images a bit more interesting and to make them stand out from the mass of images that we see, um, you know, propagated um, through the internet, through sites like Flickr and so on. And so with, with images like this, just breaking away from things like the rule of thirds, not constantly being, uh, you know, being obsessed with some of the basic principles of composition and feeling we have to um, follow them all the time. It's interesting you say yeah. that it's not about compositional, it's not about, um simplicity it's about the composition being something that leaves something to the imagination and i think that's, absolutely that's, yeah that's something that everything you've shown so far is it's leaving space for people to view exactly it. yeah yeah um and so sometimes it, you have to be a bit brave um with what you're doing with the camera because um it's not what everybody else is doing um i suppose it's uh, it's a bit like fashion and clothes isn't it um as human beings, we often like to be accepted as part of a group and we want people to like us and accept us. And so the way we're programmed to uh, to achieve that is to do what everybody else is doing. And so we all go out in the golden hour and shoot glorious sunrises and sunsets and we have a big rock in the foreground and, you know, a middle mid ground and a, a, a background and so on because we know that works and because we know it gets a lot of clicks and a lot of favourites on Flickr. Um, and sometimes it takes a bit of courage to try and show people the world as we actually see it um, and just to to experiment with our camera and do some different things and that might be by doing things like intentional camera movement but it could be just simply as framing up things in a completely unusual way um, like here just putting this this dry stone wall on the opposite side of the field, right up at the top of the frame, and being brave enough just to leave this huge field of empty space. Um, in fact, I didn't even notice when I took this photograph that there was a sheep right in the middle of the fence in the gate there, uh, uh, just sat there. It wasn't until I processed the negative that uh, the the sheep appeared to me. Uh, this is almost yeah. thinking like a graphic designer, isn't it? Because it's this, the, the shapes on the page are like you'd lay out. Uh... Um, typography and elements of design on a on a letterhead or a or a page for a design for a magazine. Um, Absolutely, thinking yeah. about them as design elements and not not the scene itself. <laughs> um, so here, just a, a foggy day on the pier at Whitby, um, and so just taking a photograph of the fog and the water. There's nothing there but the fog and the water, and so really, it's just a picture about colour uh, and softness. Uh, and just the gentle texture um, of the, uh, the the sea was hardly moving, so it was a very flat, calm sea. Uh, just very, very gentle texture. Um, we don't the, the pictures don't have to have much in them even. 
um, to uh, to be attractive uh, and to, uh, to 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 sort of you know be, be something to, to hold people's interest or, or to make them look a bit closely um, on what's going on. Um, so that's a sort of you know you can ease yourself into creative photography without having to go crazy and do really weird things. You can do. Uh, things that are closer to what you're used to before you start to move on to things that are perhaps a little bit more um, a bit more challenging so with an image like this I've now started to use a tilt and shift lens and so here I've used the tilt and shift lens to have a plane of focus on this the sort of turned earth on the ploughed field in the foreground and those trees in the background were lit by sunlight coming over my shoulder um, there's just a sort of small stand of silver birches against uh, a woodland behind them. Uh, but then in the processing, I've sort of exaggerated that effect by dodging and burning or burning down uh, the top left and right corners and, and uh, dodging the um, dodging the, uh, the trees out so that the trees come much brighter uh, to draw attention to the trees. Um, so the real point of focus is on the soil right in the foreground, but most of the rest of the picture is completely out of focus. It's very soft. Um, and so it starts to become a more challenging composition, a more challenging look. Uh, and that's a combination of using the camera a bit more creatively in the field and sort of visualizing what you can achieve then by finishing off the process in software later on. Um, the same with images like these, just some purple loose stripe stems. This is taken with a tilt and shift lens. So there's just a narrow plane of focus in the sort of, um, so the, the third quarter up from the bottom, but the top quarter and the, the bottom two quarters of the image are soft and going blurred. And again, that's just using the tilt and shift lens to introduce a plane um, of focus. Uh, in the same way here, uh, using the tilt and shift lens has pushed a, a plane of blur across the top of the image and across the bottom of the image and then the, the purple loose strife stems just in seed in the middle are sort of vaguely sharp um, across the middle. Um, here just sort of focusing on details um, sort of the sort of obscure things in life that just you just notice that well, you hardly notice um, but you just see when you're walking. Uh, not everything that you take a photograph of has to have massive impact and be a wow image. Um, I find I can look at a shot like this for a lot longer than I can look at a sunrise or a sunset. Uh, because there's things. Is this to... the intrigue and the complexity of the picture? Yeah, that's it. Yeah, yeah, it's a good way of putting it. Um, often there are things to discover or there's a story in the picture. Um, Paul Kenny was uh, talking to me and he was saying about how uh, when you're creating this kind of image, um, what you're trying to introduce is layers of interest. Um, so you might have a, a key subject, which is the main focus of the frame, but then by doing things either with the camera or with the software, or maybe within your, uh, you know, if, you, if you're pro say you're processing a negative, you uh, with scratching the negative or by altering the negative, um, or by some technique in what you're doing to, to produce your final image, you, you introduce things that add interest or that add layers of, of interest to the image that, that start to, to build up a, a story there and that start to hold you in the image and also allow you to build up your own ideas as to what's going on. These Front to back pin sharp images tell you everything instantly. Everything is very clear. The clarity uh, is wonderful and they look very beautiful. But they're all right on a calendar, I think, for a month. But I've had enough after a month. But many images from some of the photographers I love that do the sort of creative photography, I could look at for the rest of my life and not get bored of because of these layers of interest that are going on. Um, we've just, we've just had a question from um, Paul Chambers, and it goes back to what we mentioned earlier about location not being important. Um, do, you, do you still think that the sort of photography you're doing now is is location agnostic, as it were? You're quite happy working without the, the ingredients of a great location. Or... Absolutely, yeah. Um, in fact, I, I tend to get my better images of this style 
close to home or in quite anonymous places um, or it's almost a hindrance to be somewhere where there are iconic things going on because they're distracting and then it sort of it triggers off that oh I've got to capture that because that's what we're supposed to do as a photographer um, whereas if I just take stand out for a walk and, and just wander up some footpath that I found on, a, on my local ordnance survey map that I've never walked down before I can almost guarantee that I'll come back with two or three images um, that have got something in them I might take 50 or 100 images if I'm shooting digitally but in amongst them there'll be something of interest that I'll then end up processing um, so, and so you the lack of location gives you space to think about things as well then yeah and, and it makes you work harder because it, you know if you if you arrive at um, you know if you're up in Scotland if you're on the Isle of Skye um, the the beauty is sort of in your face and it, it's very clear and obvious in theory what you should be photographing and we're almost like moths to a flame and we just go for those things yeah. whereas if if we plonk ourselves down in some local park or some urban space some bit of wasteland uh, you know a, a, an old uh, coal tip that's been turned into a nature reserve where there's nothing there that we've ever seen photographed before we have to start to work and we've got to really open our eyes and look at what's going on and we have to start to find shapes and content you know texture and contrast we have to find patterns um, and we have to watch what's going on like in this picture I've just brought up here um, just noticing this this cloud coming across this field tying it in with these seed heads um, and then I don't know how well it shows up on the screen but there was a bird just flying through and this is the sort of layers of interest um, that I was talking about that, that Paul Kenny uh, talks about um, you know you perhaps don't notice the bird at first you perhaps notice the seed heads you look at the cloud and everything you start to look at the blurred areas because I was using the tilt and shift lens but gradually you start to see more things in the picture um, and it comes about because you're somewhere that you the obvious is not there to photograph and so you're photographing the obscure and you're finding beauty and interest in what is often walked by without a second glance and I think uh, I think there's a lot to be said for that um, but this is a shot I took with a little handheld compact camera the equipment is, is irrelevant it was a foggy evening I was taking stand for his last walk um, but I just noticed this wet path winding through the field and it was just glinting in the la the very last bits of light uh, in the evening and there was a figure right up at the end of the, the curve in the path um, and so it was quite a long exposure just hand holding trying to keep the camera as still as I could um, and then processing the image with dodging and burning to bring up the shape of the path and to darken down the field either side of it um, and this is just literally two minutes from the back of our house you know it's nowhere special it's literally just the field behind our house um, and yet it's an image I really like uh, um, we had a quick question off um, Phil King saying he works in an area near Shropshire and he is asking whether you can still infuse these creative thoughts and keep an essence of the landscape um, without without the landscape being too obvious so I think so it's like you can, saying can you can, can you make it relevant can you make the location relevant and still do this sort of um, creative um, Geography. make the location relevant so make the location to get an feasible. essence a bit across I think um, yeah because I, th I think that's what you're trying you're, you're trying to um, put your stamp on what you're seeing which is around you so I would say I'm trying to sort of uh, get people to look at you know I live in works up in Nottinghamshire it doesn't get any more anonymous than this but I'm trying to get people to look at this area differently um, so this stand of trees um, is down by the canal in Worksop. I'd driven past it many, many times and hardly glanced at it. But this particular evening, again, taking stand for a walk, the light was going, we were on our way back to the car. And just the glow of the, 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 the town lights behind the trees showed up the shapes and the trunks of the trees. So again, with the compact camera, um, just holding them and just introducing a little bit of ICM movement, slight up and down movement, over the exposure um, I think brings up the you know the essence of the location and for me 
um, sort of makes a statement about you know just that their beauty can be found even though we're in a sort of an anonymous Midlands town. You get an image like this taken up in you know this was taken at the beach of Bambra um, and I'd set myself a goal of going on the beach and not taking a photograph of the castle um, and so focused on what was going on out at sea uh, and just capturing um, you know the sort of stormy weather the wave patterns and so on um, and visualizing how to process it um, just again using high contrast with these kind of black and white shots so you know it's still quite standard landscape stuff in a way it's not too unconventional um, and uh, certainly if you, know, if you want to get into creative photography this sort of thing is quite achievable uh, I have noticed one commonish theme that and, and uh, Omar Ahmed asks um, how does aspect ratio affect the work you're doing in, in either intentional camera movement or in creative photography because there's a there's quite a few square images on it <laughs> yeah I definitely think square definitely and I think that's maybe a personal thing rather than a um, a technique or a, a creative thing um, I definitely have a real love for the square image and find myself thinking along framing things either to crop square or using like if I use my, my compact camera it's got a square uh, switch so I can switch to square mode to shoot it uh, so I can frame up straight away um, but equally um, sometimes if I get an image that I think works better wider then I will I will go with the, the full size of the sensor um, but definitely uh, some, pe some people tend to think in portrait mode um, and so they, they see the world very much in an upright mode um, and they may find that most of their images come out in portrait mode and certainly I, I, I make shots uh, in portrait mode but by far the majority is square. Um, when it comes to cropping for aspect ratio um, I, I look at the subject and what I want to achieve and so while the majority of my images probably do end up square um, I, I won't religiously hold to that format if I feel it doesn't suit um, the subject. Um, so for example here intentional camera movement this is probably how most people start with intentional camera movement I feel the the three to two format is fine it gives width which gives space of the woodland and this is literally just slowing the shutter down to probably two seconds and just dipping the camera down this was done on the tripod so um, I just tilt during the exposure just tilted the tripod head down slowly during the exposure and you just get this sort of classic blurring uh, of the trees. It holds enough structure so we know what it is. It's a, a pine forest in the snow, um, but uh, it's quite easy to achieve. And it's, it's the way most people start with ICM is these on, cam uh, on camera, uh, on tripod type shots, um, or perhaps shots a bit like this uh, with left to right movement um, using the ICM technique. So slowing the shutter speed down enough so that you can go from left to right um, and just just blur uh, the exposure a little bit just sort of blur the scene and then it becomes not so much about where you are but more about the light and the color uh, and the shapes that are involved um, well quick couple of questions one from david bickdyke saying asking if the square shot black and white shots are on film or digital and, and i suppose more generally do you do you tend to use digital more with this technique or are you quite happy to use film as well? If I'm doing um, ICM uh, almost always it's going to be uh, digital purely because it's a very um, haphazard process you've got very little control over the results and it gets very expensive on film this is uh, I'll show you this is an ICM shot on film um, yep. taken with a, a, an old Agfa iSelect camera medium format they cost about 30 pounds on eBay um, so this was just the wind blowing grasses and flowers about again the field at the back of our house and just moving the camera slightly along with the movement of the wind blowing the grass and the flowers uh, but I, I can't afford to do a lot of ICM uh, on film so most of the shots that you'll see here that are ICM will be on uh, digital in which case most most are cropped because I'll have done them probably with my 5D. Um, some right, of them, yeah. um, you know, like, like this one that we talked about earlier, that was on my Panasonic LX5, which has got, got a square, square crop. Suit. 
Yeah. Uh, Mart Martin Lay asks you, um, do you use ND filters and also have you ever tried ICM with a pinhole camera? Um, I see on the pinhole camera, no, actually, I haven't tried it with uh, the pinhole. Uh, pinhole would be ideal in that you've automatically got a long exposure. You, you're never really going to get an exposure less than a second, uh, and often much, much longer than that. Um, so I'll have to have a bash at that and see how that works, actually. Uh, I'll be interested to see what happens. Good idea. Um, and ND filters are absolutely essential for doing the ICM technique in daylight. Um, the, the sweet spot for me is between about one to five seconds is the kind of shutter speed I'm aiming for. Um, so that would depend on how far I want to move the camera, the subject and so on. So these very ND filters that you can buy, which rotate, um, are quite good for, for uh, ICM uh, image making um, because you can adjust the amount of ND strength you're getting very easily because you're hand holding the camera, you can leave the tripod in the car, which is wonderful. And then you can just dial in as much neutral density filtration with them as you like to get the shutter speed you want. You're not really interested in depth of field at all. So I'm using the ND filters and the aperture purely to control the length of exposure. Um, and then I will approximately focus on the main features. So say for example, this shot here, I would have focused on the tree, for example, but then you're going to move the camera about. So focus is not irrelevant, but it's almost irrelevant. Depth of field is certainly irrelevant with ICM. So, you know, if I need to use F22, I will. You know, I'm not interested in diffraction or anything like that. Uh, it's wonderful to be liberated from all the things that worry us as classic landscape photographers. But if I want to, if, if, if I need F2.8 to get me the shutter speed, that I want, I'll use f2.8. Uh, I'm using the aperture pu purely to control shutter speed. Um, so in bright daylight, you will need a 10 stop filter to, to slow the shutter down enough. Um, so I carry a 10 stop, a two stop, a three stop, and a polarizer, because uh, a polarizer will take two stops of light off as well. Um, and I will stack them up in different combinations to get the shutter speed uh, that I'm after. So, for example, um, a shot like this one, that's about five seconds. Um, that was taken down at um, uh, the Jurassic Coast, somewhere along there, uh, somewhere like West Bay or something like that. Um, that effect is all done purely in camera. Uh, there's no textures been applied to that at all. Um, I've just messed about with the colors, the, the, the white balance and so on once I've got it home. But the, the long exposure effect is purely in camera, just to give that sort of painterly, uh, almost Turner-like effect, which is the, the effect that I'm really striving for. Um, if I Somebody asked that, about achieving, achieving some of these colours, like, uh, particularly a Chris Friel-like colour, which was from Julie Fuchs. Um, yeah. Is that, is that mostly in post-processing colour temperature? Absolutely, yeah. Um, you, I mean, you can alter the white balance in camera if you like, but I'd encourage you to shoot raw. Uh, I just shoot with auto white balance. I don't worry about the colours while I'm shooting. Um, I alter the colours when I get home. And with this kind of creative photography, I'm not interested in reality one little bit. So the first thing I would go to is the white balance sliders and I would just play with those and see what happens. And you can be quite extreme with the white balance sliders, so have a go with those. But then use things like selective coloring or the saturation and hue sliders uh, and alter those and ju just play um, with, with the colors uh, because you're not portraying reality. Uh, you know, we're not, we're not trying to hit some sort of uh, technically perfect bluebell wood or something like that with this kind of photography. We are portraying almost a surreal view of the world. Um, and it's more about the emotion that we're getting into the image and the, uh, the feelings that the image conveys than uh, any, any sort of, any kind of reality. Uh, so an image I'm, like I'm this, I've, I've probably, you know, take, made the white balance much warmer, for example. Simon Sorry. Powell asked, um, it, 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 for a particular image, can you pick a particular image and give, give us an idea of why you picked, what, what uh, mood you were in at the time and what, why it, why it um, moved you to take a shot in a particular way? Okay, yeah. 
got a good one here that will do that. Um, I was up on the Isle of Harris. Uh, Elizabeth and I were up there uh, on a holiday, a sort of shooting holiday. Um, anybody who knows the Isle of Harris knows that the weather changes about every three minutes. Um, and we were there for a period when storms were coming in one after another. Um, and it was absolutely fantastic. Um, and I wanted to convey the, um, just the sort of the power and the, um, I don't know, the majesty of it all. Um, the light was absolutely magical. Um, and so here I've used the ICM technique to make everything very obscure. So you can just make out the outlines of the, um, the mountains across the, the lock here. This is near um, Sea Le Boast um, uh, on the beach there. Um, and the light was sort of filtering through the clouds. The clouds kept breaking and then we would get absolutely drenched with rain. And I just wanted to capture that sort of power and majesty and the, the, the awe of the light and everything um, uh, with this kind of image. And, and I, I, I did some shots which were just standard landscape shots and they just didn't do it for me. Um, they were just too sterile. Uh, whereas an image like this was much closer to how I felt when I was there. Uh, another day on the same trip, uh, I made this image, similar kind of weather it was a bit brighter but it was still showers coming in off the atlantic um, and sort of battering us we were constantly running back and jumping in the camper van five minutes later back out when the rain had passed and, and onto the beach and again just to sort of you can make out the faint lines of the mountains the, the light reflecting on the wet sand and the water in the bay and on the beach and the drama of the light in the sky and for me it really conjures up how I felt on that holiday, witnessing the weather coming in uh, onto Harris. Um, so, you know, that's the sort of kind of emotion that I felt while I was there. Um, and it was the ICM images that did it for me. The classic landscapes that I was shooting with my commercial head on just didn't do anything for me at all. Are there, Tim? I'm still here, yes. That's yeah, nice. sorry. Um, yes, is, is there any problems using a polarizer for the sort of work you're doing? And do you use it as, as a polarizer rather than just an ND as well? Um, sometimes just as an ND, just to slow the shutter down even more. Um, but no, you can use the polarizing effect to have an effect on the colors and the contrast in the image. Um, so it's worth, uh, I use the live view screen when I'm doing ICM. So I'll put the polarizer on and I'll rotate it and just see what it does to the colors and contrast of the image. And then I'll start moving the camera about and shooting with it and see what results I get from it. So the, the sort of technique I follow with ICM is that I'll go for a walk. I'll just have the camera around my neck with one lens on, usually something like a 24 to 70 zoom. And I'll have, um, my filters with me in my pocket probably the 10 stop filter will be in place to start off with and i'll just be taking icm images of things i see as i walk down the footpath then um what, what you'll see on the back of the camera won't be doing anything for you it'll all just be rubbish every shot you take nothing will be happening won't excite you then all of a sudden you you'll perhaps turn a corner or you'll take an image and i get like a tingle <laughs> I get a sort of a, a feeling inside that, oh, no, that's got something. When, as soon as I get that, I stop. And I'll stay on that, at that spot and then until I've got the image that I want. So I'll look at the image I've just got, and I'll try and work out what it is about the image that's given me that feeling of excitement or that, that tingle, if you like. And then I'll think, what do I now need to do to improve it? What, what Do I need to move the camera more? Do I need to move the camera less? Have I moved the camera in the right direction? Uh, perhaps do I need to move it for a while and then hold it still for a few seconds? Um, do, uh, do I need to zoom out a bit more, zoom in a bit more, whatever? And I will then keep on taking shot after shot, looking at the results and fine tuning what I do lengthening the exposure, shortening the exposure by changing aperture or by changing the filters uh, until I get the sort of completed image. 
And what I'd say is that if you go out shooting ICM images, if you go out and shoot 20, 30 or 40 images, in all likelihood, all of them will be rubbish. If I go out for half a day shooting ICM images, I would expect to take at least 500 shots, possibly more, 750 shots sometimes. And out of that, I would probably end up processing two, three or four images. Most of them go in the bin. So if ever any of you have, have had a go at doing ICM and then just thought you're no good at it, it's probably because you haven't shot enough images and because you haven't fine-tuned the image. So what I'd encourage you to do is go out somewhere, find something that starts to work, and then just stand where you are, stay where you are, and work that location until you've got what you want. Force yourself to hone it down and keep fine-tuning. Um, and ultimately, the image will appear. What I would say as well is they always look better on the back of the camera than they do when you get home. So it's another reason for taking a lot of images because there will be a lot of images you're just going to delete and discuss. Um, so you've really got to work at these images. It's not a technique because it's so random and because you've got so little control over what happens during the exposure, you've got to work hard at it. It's not a quick fix. Um, a lot of people think it's just wiggling the camera about. And I suppose it is, but actually there's a bit more science to it than that and a bit more effort goes into it than that to get the uh, to get the final image that you want. We've got a question from uh, Guy Prince saying, have you ever experimented with lens flare and um, and blurring with for the creative photography? Um, I haven't really, um, if, if, I, if I got lens flare um, in an ICM image and it was working, then I'd be quite happy to work with it. I can't think of any images off the top of my head that I've got in my library that are particularly uh, strong on lens flare. Um, he mentions he mentions a, a photographer called Malov Milan or M A L O V A R H Milan. We'll try and we'll try and pick up some of that um, in, in yeah. a follow up article. This for when for when we put the video yeah, up. That's uh, thanks for the yeah. question, guy. Yeah, not not no, I don't know about that one. No. Um, but you can even do ICM with your iPhone. So, for example, a shot like that has been done with the iPhone. Uh, there's an app called Slow Shutter. Um, yes. And it lets you take control of the shutter speed of the, uh, the camera. Um, you need it to be quite dark, really. So around sunrise, sunset, you know, dusk time is the best. Or go into somewhere like woodland or indoors into buildings, things like that. Um, that's taken on an iPhone in a woodland. Um, all done in camera. Um, apart from some colour manipulation, once I've got it back into uh, into Photoshop, again that's that's done on an iPhone. So even with an iPhone, you don't have to have a fancy SLR or anything like that to do ICM photography. It's one of the other beauties about it. It's not dependent on having uh, you know expensive kit or anything. If you've just got a camera where you can control the shutter speed, you can create ICM images. Um, so you know compact camera users. Um, I've broken a few Lee big stoppers in my time and I keep the larger pieces of broken glass um, and I, I keep them in my pouch with my compact camera and then I just hold the piece of big stopper glass over the lens of my compact camera and then move the compact camera around and the, the, the bit of broken big stopper glass just keeps the light out of the lens long enough for me to get a long exposure. Um, so you know you might be able to find ways of just slowing down your shutter speed. Um, just to give you the, uh, you know, the sort of creative effect um, that you're after. What, what sort of other um, techniques are you thinking about when you're looking at these in terms of, I mean, I look at the picture that's up on the screen at the moment with the tree mm -hmm. in the foreground and, and seeing the highlights moving around. Are those, are those from, the, uh, from the wheat or grass in the foreground that you've, that you've used to paint over the rest of the picture, as it were? Yeah, so so this shot was taken uh, with a, believe it or not, with a bright blue sky, uh, a red hot summer's day. Um, but again, this is where I've broken the rules of the camera. I, I've put probably six stops of ND grad filter into my Lee filter holder, which has artificially darkened the sky down and made it look a bit stormy. Um, then um, there's uh, some ND filters on to slow the shutter down. 
um, and I knelt right down in the grass. So this is sort of um, dried grasses that are in front of the lens. That tree is actually not on a hill. Uh, in reality, that tree is on a flat uh, sort of level piece of land. All right. Okay. But, but because of moving the camera, it gives the it's given the effect of it being on a slope. So you get all sorts of unusual things happen when you do ICF. Um, and they can be, you know, can be very fortuitous what, what takes place. But it's the it's the camera moving through the grasses, and the lens got very close to the grasses, perhaps even touched some of the grasses. Yeah. That's given that sort of golden texture at the front. That's not a texture that I've added afterwards. That's all been done in camera. Um, uh, if you saw the original raw file for this picture, I've actually manipulated it very little. I've slightly darkened the sky down at the top a little bit. And I've just brightened the foreground a little bit, but apart from that, it's pretty much straight out of the camera. Uh, that shot. We're getting close to um, uh, taking some questions, Doug. So if you sure. can, uh, wind up a little bit on that. Yeah, no, I'm happy to take questions if you'd like to go ahead. Well, we're getting a few questions which have been about um, technique and post-processing. So what I'd say to people is, if we'll try and save some of those questions um, for either the next part where we do. We look more at the technique. Um, so, if you've got any, any more questions, particularly about technique or particularly about post processing, then send them through on on the usual Twitter or, or here where we've saved them, and we'll cover those during those two parts of the webinar. Um, but we, we have had a question asking about which version of slow shutter you use on the iPhone. Come on, I mean, I was very impressed with some of the results from the iPhone there. Uh, he said, just grabbing his. Um, <laughs> Um, hang on just a second. How do I tell what version I've got? Let's have a look. Uh, I think it may, may mean what there's a few different apps that do slow shutter now. All right. So this is um, slow shutter, and it's all one word, and it's capital S for slow and capital S for shutter. So that's the version we'll try, I we'll try, and we'll try and feature that on the um, on the when we do the video. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, um, it's got a, it's got an auto setting which will slow the camera will, will slow it down as much as it can, or you can manually take control of the shutter. Um, but obviously, you can only slow the shutter down as much as the light allows. Um, you've still got the problem of overexposure if if you slow the shutter down too much. Um, we we so had a question that's... from from um, if you bear with me just a moment. Um, if you only had a 5D Mark One or a 5D Mark II, and we're talking about the multiple exposure mode here, yeah. do, can people do the sort of multi-exposure mode using the uh, older cameras that don't include it in camera, or is it is it feasible, um, or is the amount of experimenting and, and um, merging pictures together really makes it too difficult? Um, to do it. Uh, the only way I think you can do it if you haven't got a camera that blends in camera will be to do it in software. Um, and so, you know, we can show that when we do the, uh, the software yeah. um, uh, version. But basically, you'll be using the blending modes in Photoshop or Elements uh, to blend. Um, Rob Hudson does a, has developed his own fantastic technique uh, for doing that because he uses a Canon 5D Mark II. And for his yeah. Songs of Travel uh, series, if, if you get a chance to have a look at Rob Hudson's uh, website, he's got a series of multiple exposure images that he's called Songs of Travel, where he's taken um, dozens of exposures and then has developed a way of blending them together. I don't know how he does that, actually, because he blends a lot of images together. Um, yeah. But it can, obviously can be done in, in software. Uh, and he gets a beautiful uh, sort of black and white painterly effect uh, there are some really... photo stacking software that's normally used for um, like astrophotography, which we can uh, feature as um, put links to in the article as well. So, oh, okay, uh, interesting. Yeah, very good, very good. Yeah. Um, yeah. Also, uh, also, we had a question um, from Phil King saying, "Do you find the irregularities of using film, or the potential irregularities of using film, add to your creativity? And is that one of the reasons why you choose to use film?" Um, I use film partly because the feel I get from it, I can't, I've tried to get digitally. If I could have got it digitally, I would have done. Um, but there is a, uh, it has a texture and a, a look which I can't 
duplicate digitally and I've not found a plugin that does it satisfactorily. Um, also just the, the very process of working with a film camera slows you down and it makes you think um, and it concentrates the mind. The fact that it's sort of a pound per click it kind of uh, makes you think twice about pressing the shutter so it makes you more considered um, but not doing 570 pictures per, per day when it costs you that much. No, I, I certainly couldn't afford to do ICM with a, with a film camera, there's no chance. Um, yeah. But, but I, equally, I'm, I'm not snobbish about these things. If, if I think a digital camera will give me better results, that's what I grab out of my bag. And I carry yeah. both with me. I'm not obsessed about kit. You know, and when I use film cameras, my, my lenses are old tatty ones, my camera bodies are old tatty ones. You know, I'm not looking for, um, you know, the best shot. In fact, if anything, I want things that are a bit softer, um, a bit yeah. more run in, um, because I, I want obscurity in my pictures. I'm not looking for clarity. I want people we just to know, it, we, make up their own mind to build up a story, you know. We just had a desperate question from uh, Kath Wood saying, please tell us about the horse image you're currently showing. <laughs> okay. Um, the horse image was taken with a compact camera, my LX5 again. Uh, I was taking Stan for a walk again. Uh, he was pulling on the lead. He wanted to go in one direction. He was very bored of me photographing the horses. So this was taken one-handed. Um, the exposure is probably around about a second or just under a second. So um, I've moved the camera just very slightly and the horse was jumping up a bit on the other side of the hedge. Um, I've been feeding the horses with grass and things and sort of fussing them and what have you. Um, and this one was great because it was sort of jumping and shake, shaking its head, which, which added to the, the sense of movement. But this is an image where after I've got the basic image, um, I've then added a texture on top. So this sort of background texture feel here um, comes from texturing, which is done in Photoshop. And I will show you how to do that in the podcast when we do the, the software part uh, because it's not complicated um, and it's very therapeutic. I enjoy texturing, so uh, it can add an interesting dimension to some images. If you don't mind me asking a, a question as well, um, do, you, do you think that really the, the, one of the main ways of learning how to take pictures using this technique is to do it? And, and, and use the discoveries that you make while you're doing it to try and hone uh, your own flavour. Yeah, yeah. A couple of cases in point. If you look at what Val de Bailey is doing with um, multiple exposures, you know, we, we've seen what Chris Friel does, but Val has gone out and has just experimented herself and tried her own thing and has developed her own style as a result. And so that's good because she's not becoming a, a Chris Friel clone or anything. She's, she's becoming her own photographer um, and, and is producing some amazing images. So I really encourage you to have a look at her site and see what she's doing. Um, and if you, if you sort of listen and watch what Chris, Chris Friel does himself, he'll often get a piece of kit that's designed to do one thing. And then he'll, he'll sort of ask himself, so what happens if I do the opposite? You know, if we're supposed to use a lens, like a tilt shift lens to correct converging verticals or to get, you know, to do the shine flow principle and get amazing depth of field, what happens if I turn it in the opposite direction? And so that's what I encourage, I'd encourage people to do, to get their cameras and to do the opposite or to do something different. Put things in front of the lens. You know, go, go out and get a bit of, I don't know, get a bit of a plastic pot bottle uh, and try shooting through it and just see what shooting through different materials does to the images. Does it create a different effect? Sandra um, Bartoka is a master at doing that, isn't she? Yeah, well, exactly. You know, the, the, you, you know it's, it's highly unlikely you'll fall on something that's unique, but go, just go out and have a play. You know, so things like the ICM, some, whether it was Chris Friel or somebody else, somebody must have ha had the idea of moving the camera during the exposure at some point. Um, and there's lots of photographers like Alexei Titarenko and so on who create absolutely breathtaking images now uh, by moving the camera and yet we're supposed to keep the camera as still as we can because we're supposed to want front to back sharpness and yet um, I think it introduces something magical into pictures so um, yeah I'd really encourage people to just get out and experiment and just play um, 
look at go into the menus and have a look at some of the unusual functions of the cameras um, and they may be designed for one thing but just try and do something different with them see what happens it may well turn out to be disastrous well you know you don't have to show anybody you can just move on and try something else but it's the you know it's the uh, it's the, the creative photographer has that striving for something different the, the, the sort of finding something uh, that helps them realize their vision um, and uh, it's the playing it's having that playful element that, that can that help you get there thanks very much for that Doug. um yeah. and i'd just like to point out that the way we're going to uh, look at the next two parts um of the uh, series is to go out with Doug on location and do some um work on how to how to find pictures how to work with a camera so the practicalities of using the camera and the practicalities of what subject matter to look at uh, and that will um, be towards the uh, end of october i think and then we're going to follow that up with another webinar in november to look at the processing side so um, i'm sorry if you've asked questions about that we, we won't be losing them we'll keep a record of them and we'll make sure they get asked at the time or get included in what we cover uh, as part of the seminar. Um, so I'd, I'd just like to wind up by saying a very big thank you to Doug for this. Uh, awesome. and, and I'm really looking forward to seeing the uh, uh, what comes in the next two parts. Very good. That's great. It's been a pleasure. Uh, just apologize to everybody that didn't manage to log on. I think there must be about 60 or 70 people who haven't been able to log on that thought they were going to be able to. So Yes, yeah, so we, we, we've had somebody looking at the software and the, and the people in the software says uh, it, it doesn't happen very often when you when you get something oversubscribed and uh, and and then you get everybody coming along at once. So I think it's a, a testament to you, Doug, that nearly everybody <laughs> that uh, signed up wanted to come along. So very, very sorry for the people who couldn't make it. Um, hopefully this video that we've, we've recorded everything and that will go out in uh, the next issue so you won't have missed out on anything uh, hopefully so um, thank you very much for the background help we've had and thank you very much for Doug um, and for everybody coming thank you.